guys, this is Kate with Beach Moto. We're doing another episode of Ask an Expert. And uh, today with us is a Scott from Arai Helmet. Scott, how's it going? Excellent. How are you doing? Good. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so we are big fans of um, Arai Helmets, and I'm excited okay. to talk to you. Um, you know, a little side note, I actually, my first like real, real helmet was an Arai helmet. Um, and I, I still this day still have that helmet. It's like a display piece <laughs> on my I bookcase can't, now. Can't. Um, so tell us a little bit about Arai. You guys have been around for a long time. So tell us a little bit about uh, how long you've been around and where you know, you've know you come since then. So Arai helmets were started in Japan by Mr. Hirotaki Arai. He created the very first motorcycle helmet in Japan. Oh, wow. You may have seen those uh, famous pictures of him surfing on his seat and tank of his motorcycle. It's kind of a famous picture out there, but so he realized he needed a helmet. There was no helmet that he could buy in Japan because there was no motorcycle helmets being made at the time. So he created the very first motorcycle helmet before there were any standards or a guide or anything to tell him what he should do and he did it to protect his own head. And so that was nearly 70 years ago and that same principle of making a helmet good enough to protect your own head is still what guides Arai's decisions in how they make helmets. Because they're motorcyclists themselves. This is not a you know, third party that's private labeling a helmet for someone. These are avid motorcyclists who wear what they make. So it has to be good enough for themselves. So right. they make the same helmet for us. So we get the exact same high quality helmet that Mr. Michihio Arai, the current president of the company, we get the same quality helmet that the president of the company wears because he has an off the shelf production helmet. So their feeling is that nobody deserves a better helmet than anyone else. Everyone's head is just as valuable as anyone else's. So. They focus on making protection their number one priority. And so whenever Mr. Uh, Mitch Arai finally decides that he's ready to retire, then his son Akihito Arai will take over. Then that will be the third generation of Arai ownership. There's no shareholders, no in investors. So they don't have to make decisions based on what meets the latest marketing trend or what are the shareholders demanding of us. They make what they believe gives you the most protection and that's really what this company is all about is how can we make our riders more protected and enjoy riding their bikes for longer yeah and i, I mean ride seems like a really big company because you see i mean you see them everywhere you know you see them in motorsports and uh you know like automotive racing and um regular motorcycle racing but yeah it's still a small family-owned company right exactly yeah. and that's what keeps them focused on their principles rather than having to follow different trends. Yeah, um, but as far as following trends, how, how has Arai evolved um, since you know, the beginning? Like if you look at the, I guess, um, like purely aesthetically what the helmets look like, um, like my helmet from 15 years ago and my brother's helmet actually, he got his first Arai about 20 years ago. Uh, they still look very similar to what the helmets look like now. So um, what is the story behind that? Does, does Arai kind of believe that they found the ultimate, you know what I mean, um, technology and they're sticking to it? Or has there been an evolution, but it's not so obvious to a naked eye? Yeah, I think you nailed it right there. There is a slow evolution process. And every generation, they're building on what they learned from that previous generation. If they make a big radical change, it's harder to control the variables or predict what's gonna happen in a crash. And so each generation of a Rai helmet builds on what they learned in the previous generation. So even though you can see behind me, I've got uh, a collection of Arai's that my wife and I have worn over the many years. Um, and the same thing, you look at some of my, my very first Arai right here, doesn't look a whole lot different from my latest Arai. But right. the general principles of what creates protection don't change. And one of those general principles is glancing off an object. Because no matter how good you make a helmet, no matter how much money you put into it, direct impact forces can overwhelm even the best helmet shell. So by making a helmet round and smooth, 
you increase the chance of sidestepping that impact and glancing off of that impact so that you don't have to deal with direct impact forces. That's the hope, because it's very hard to expect a helmet to deal with massive, direct, non-deflected impact forces. So by keeping that smooth round shape, making everything on the outside of the helmet easy to break off, you increase the chance that you won't have the rotational forces inside of the helmet you increase the chance of skipping off those impacts so like you said a lot of the things that have been improvements over the years is up underneath the paint you can't see it so they have evolved the materials the resins the way the, the fabric is woven that goes into the helmet and they've added lots of different materials but it's all up underneath the paint gotcha. so it's something that um i really works to create true protect protection out of the helmet but not create a gimmick right right so if it's something that would be flashier and show that there's more protection but it takes away from protection they're not going to do it they're not going to add something that looks like a new protective feature that doesn't actually add more protection they're always yeah. going to be what they believe is truly the best for you yeah, and let's talk about the shell a little bit. So one of the things that sold me on an array helmet, you know, back when I got mine, is the dealer I was purchasing the helmet from had like a naked array shell. And he mm -hmm. said, hey, stand on the shell, jump on it, you know, and see what it does. Um, and it was extremely impressive to see how strong that shell was. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys use a fiberglass shell or maybe it's a composite shell. Um, so why is it that you choose that material as opposed to some of the other material materials out there, like uh, polycarbonate, as an example? Um, what are your thoughts on that material and how it compares to what you guys use? So Arai has decades of experience with fiberglass, so they really understand how to manipulate this material. They start with an aerospace grade fiberglass. They heat it and stretch it so that they can make the fiber finer and they can have more fiber and less resin in the end product. Fiberglass is a very good material for absorbing and dispersing energy. If you saw on that shell, it has a random weave to it. We call it a bird's nest. The fibers go in every different direction. So whenever it has an impact, it can spread those impact forces throughout the helmet instead of it being concentrated in one area. And so, one of the real benefits to fiberglass versus a polycarbonate, and especially the way that Arai makes it, is that it can be strong, yet at the same time flexible. And so maybe it gets to the point where the resin actually does crack. The way the fibers are woven inside there, the fibers can still hold the structure of the helmet together. With polycarbonate, it's an injection molded plastic. Whenever it takes a big hit, it's going to have a clean catastrophic break. And then you expose the EPS foam. And then that's really dangerous in a crash if now that soft energy absor absorbing styrofoam is now exposed to the environment. That's really dangerous. So fiberglass just offers so many benefits in terms of weight, strength, energy absorption, and the way that Arai makes it, the ability to still be flexible enough to give some with impact, but still hold together without having that catastrophic break. Okay, so in your professional opinion, when it comes, you know, it comes to like comparing the two, because obviously you hear different people say different things, but you know, by nature, fiberglass is without a doubt a stronger or a more protective shell than a polycarbonate shell. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. And um, when it comes to what's underneath that shell, so you guys use uh, EPS foam, right, multi-density EPS foam. Um, now we're starting to see um, helmet manufacturers add more like um, impact absorbing technology to their helmets, you know, like MIPS, for example, is one that um, I, I maybe they've been around for a while in like bicycle helmets, but now they're starting to definitely come around to street helmets for motorcycles. What are your thoughts on technology like that? And how does just having the EPS foam compare to, uh, you know, uh, MIPS types of technology out there? So the EPS foam that Arai uses is very unique in the industry. And also the way that Arai makes the EPS liner individually for each helmet shell size is also unique in the industry. So you may have seen the images of the color-coded multi-density EPS liners. Yep. The density goes from firm around the edges 
to progressively softer up to the top. The range of firm to soft changes as the head size gets bigger. So as the head gets bigger, it has more mass and mass has more impact energy given the same velocity. So for the smaller helmets, the EPS is softer, just like a, a, a lighter weight rider needs a lighter set of springs, a lighter head needs a softer EPS liner. So that is something that's completely different with Araya and every other manufacturer out there, the way that we tailor the EPS to that specific rider's projected head weight. And so when it comes to the anti-rotational systems that you see on the market, many of those systems are put inside of helmets that have the potential for additional rotational forces being added to the rider's head because of the shape of the shell. Oh. Keeping that round, smooth shell increases the chances when you have the impact, you glance off. If you have flat areas, if you have facets, you know, kind of angular flat areas on the helmet, if you have large fixed spoilers and big edges raised off the helmet, you can increase the chance of having more friction and impact because you got more surface area. So it creates more of a stop moment or it creates more rotational force on that rider's head. So by having, you know, these wedge shapes, they look cool, they look fast, they look modern but they don't add the protection. And that kind of relates back to what I was saying earlier. Arai's not gonna do something that, you know, just, just for a appearance. It has to increase protection or else they're not gonna do it. I gotcha. And, and some of these things that people put on the, their helmets, they look nice, but they could take away from the ultimate protection capabilities of that helmet. So we don't do it. So like well, a mohawk, you guys, you know, wouldn't put a mohawk. You know, the mohawk's totally fine. Everybody should know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the analogies that Mr. Arai uses, I think is really clever, is that he talks about rotational forces being like a thief. And you want to keep the thief out of your house, right? So the best way to combat the thief is by not letting him into your home. Mm -hmm. so your home is your helmet. So if you put these anti-rotation systems inside of the helmet, but yet the helmet increases rotational potential, then you're battling the thief once he's inside of the house rather than trying to keep the thief outside of the house. And then your anti-rotation system is taking up space that could be occupied by more energy absorbing material on the inside. So we wanna fight rotation on the, out of the sh outside of the shell and maximize the inside of the shell for direct energy absorption, because that is the hardest thing to fight. The most stringent impact standard in the world is the Snell impact standard, and it's a 17 and a half mile an hour non-deflected impact. And if you ever drop your cell phone, you know if your cell phone hits straight on the floor, it's much more likely to damage it right. and possibly kick it before it hits the floor and make it slide across the floor. Yeah. So if you think about that, the most stringent impact standard is only a 17 and a half mile an hour non-deflected impact. So then as you start increasing that speed, you start multiplying that impact energy. And so it's hard to expect a helmet to take a direct impact when you start talking about interstate road race speeds, things like that. So the best chance you have is to glance off of that impact and not deal with it head on. Okay, so basically the external like rotational, um, you know, technology uh, if for you guys is more important in that sense than the internal one, right? Like basically attack the issue at the source. And the way Arai ar arrives at that conclusion is they have decades of trackside experience. Right. I guess we're probably 45 to 50 years now that Arai has been involved and motorsports racing. So they've seen just about everything that can happen in really high speed impacts. And that's how they make their decisions. It's not a matter of coming up with a new technology and thinking, hmm, maybe that worked. Let's test it in a laboratory, prove it in a laboratory based on a test that you create and then market it as a new material that works. Everything that Arai has learned has been learned the hard way over decades of watching you know drivers they care about a lot crash riders they care about crash and learning from those crashes 
So when you as a consumer buy an Lorai helmet, you're wearing a helmet that's been crash tested and proven by many, many years of development by professional athletes and not something that was just recently developed in a laboratory, certified, passed DOT, ECE, whatever, and then has been sold to you. There's a real pedigree, there's a real history behind every decision that Arai makes. Right. So, and, uh, you know, one of the questions that we get asked about on a regular basis when it comes to Arai is, the the there's like modern technology right that has been uh like coming on board like as, with helmets as far as uh, modular helmets bluetooth helmets you know all these uh you know added things and my answer to these people you know oh, why doesn't Orion make modular helmets well because they're you know they won't pass smell testing right and smell is something that's really important to Orion. and then what the questions that uh combat my response is while Arai makes open face helmets, you know, which uh, are way less safe. And, you know, uh, uh, as a major, I guess, um, what's the word? Like, as far as what everyone thinks, open mm -hmm. face helmets are a lot less safe than a modular helmet. So what's the Arai's decision uh, behind having an open face helmet, but not doing a modular helmet? So for some people, a open face helmet is the most helmet they can wear. And I'm sure you've probably experienced that in your store whenever someone goes to put on a full face helmet, maybe suggest to them, maybe you should try a full face helmet. They put it on, they immediately have to take it off. They're just claustrophobic, they just can't do it. So for some people, open face, three quarter, that's the best that we can do for those people. In terms of a modular, Arai has worked on modular designs for many, many years. They have you know, working developmental models that would pass Snell right now. But for them, uh, Snell is not the only uh, test that they're looking to pass. They have their own internal standards. So a helmet has to be the kind of weight and balance and protection level, the size, everything that they would want out of their own helmet. So it's not a matter of just making a helmet that meets a new market demand but a helmet that actually does what they expect the helmet to do if they're going to put their own children in it. Mm -hmm. So that it, whenever, whenever Mr. Arai is satisfied that their module design meets all of his criteria that he judges all of their helmets by, then maybe they'll sell it then, but not until then. And so, you know, if they have a chin bar on a helmet, it has to stay closed. It's not going to be acceptable if someone crashes in that helmet and the chin bar opens up. Yeah. And it takes a lot of extra material. It takes a lot of extra weight, a lot of extra money to make a helmet that has a chin bar that's strong enough to perform like a fixed chin bar in a modular style helmet. So there's a lot to consider there. So you're telling me there's a chance. There's a chance we might see one in the future. There's always a chance, I guess, <laughs> but. Uh, it'll be up to them and whenever they're they're satisfied that it will give you the same protection as one of their fixed chin bar helmets then they'll release it well I really hope that's the case because we're gonna have a lot of very happy customers if yeah. Mariah comes out with one of those right. so as far as the models uh, that are out right now um, so there's uh, obvious differences between like the the Corsair you know uh, you can like obviously see the difference you know the difference your like dual sport helmets again you can obviously see the difference um but some of the more like street oriented helmets like um the signet uh, well, on the signet x we again we obviously know the difference because it's the only really like long oval helmet on the market that um, helps you go with the hot spot but as far as like the defiant x the um quantum x and then the new uh, region x models what are the true differences between those because uh you can see subtle differences uh on the outside but they they seem very minor so uh, are there more differences to it that again the naked eye can't see so the way i like to think about it is the quantum and the signet are the two bookends to the lineup okay the signet is the most long narrow shape the quantum is the most round oval. It's the closest to being an equal round oval that we have for North America. Those helmets are virtually identical in every respect except for the shape of the shell and the EPS. Okay. So those are your two bookends. They're the two extremes of the Arai fit that we have for North America. Long, narrow, 
intermediate round oval shape. I'm sorry, round oval shape. Everything else is an intermediate oval shape. And when you look at the helmets that are in the intermediate oval family, they have a little more of a specific purpose. So of course, the Corsair is your road race helmet. The XD4 is your dual sport helmet. The Region is kind of our entry level price point helmet. But it doesn't matter which helmet you choose. If you wanted to wear the Corsair helmet on your Vespa scooter, totally fine. You want to wear the Regent X on your Panigale and go out and do a track day. Totally fine. You're not going to get a tiered level of protection when you buy more or less expensive a rise. You're getting more included features, more adjustment, um, more uh, technologically kind of advanced interior material. You have the moisture wicking, the antimicrobial. And then when you have something on the entry level side, it just has more basic features. It doesn't have as much adjustment. It doesn't come with many, as many um, extras in the box. So that's kind of the way that you know, I, I like to think about it. Whatever awry you choose, it needs to be the one that matches the shape of your head and the purpose you know, that you uh, want to use it for is kind of up to you. Okay, so it's not like one helmet is like specific for sport bikes, one helmet is specific for sitting upright on your bike. They are interchangeable and uh, they have slight internal shape um, differences. You will get more airflow out of the Corsair, say if you're on an R1 versus if you're on a uh, FZ1, right? Because okay. when you're upright in that seating position, you're going to get you're still going to get a lot of airflow out of the Corsair, but if you just lean into that R1 riding position, you'll right. feel an in the airflow. Okay. But still, even sitting upright in the Corsair, it still has an airflow level that's probably equivalent to the, the Quantum or the Signet when they're in more of these sport touring modes. So yeah, you will get some benefits out of the helmets when you use them as they were intended, but that intention doesn't limit how you can use the helmet. Okay, and we were excited when the region came out because uh, you know we heard when it was uh, initially announced, we heard that it was going to be like a more like entry level price point. Then when we saw the mm -hmm. price, we we're like, well, <laughs> entry yeah. level for some people maybe. But um, does Arai have any plans to uh, come out with a helmet that's more like you know maybe three to four hundred or, uh, or or even four to five hundred range to make it more accessible to uh, riders that can't afford that 600 plus price point. Right. So it's really difficult. So one thing to keep in mind is all Arai helmets are handmade in Japan using Japanese source materials. So the difference in cost between that and what it costs to make helmets in some other countries is pretty dramatic. It'd be kind of like, you know, what would a handmade helmet here in the U.S. cost? It'd be about the same. So it's difficult to have that quality of craftsmanship that people who've worked at Arai for many, many years, decades in some cases. There's some skilled craftsmen there that are putting your helmets together. And then the, the real high quality materials they use. So, you know, the, the Region X it's hard to think or conceptualize a helmet that's much less expensive than that unless it was completely stripped of all features. They would just have to take all the vents off, fix all the interior in place, and you know, it's hard to make it a whole lot less expensive than that given what you're getting for your money. And this is something I truly believe, having a chance to go and work in the factory is I really think you're getting more than what you pay for. When you see the way that Arai helmets are made and you see how much handmade labor goes into it and you just think about what does it cost to actually pay somebody to do all these tedious tasks versus having, versus having a machine injection mold and crank out shells that are basically ready to be painted whenever they come out of the mold. There's so much labor that goes into it. It's amazing they can actually sell them for what they do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw some of the uh, Arai like factory videos um, and I'll, I'll link them with these videos. But yeah, it's definitely very impressive to see, you know, how much work goes into it. I don't think people realize uh, just how handmade they are and what that truly means. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of the more like, uh, I guess, generic. Um, sorry, I'm going to turn off the phone here. Some of the more generic helmet questions that we get. Um, so uh, 
the main one that I get very often is about like the longevity of a helmet. So we're used to telling people that, you know, it's uh, five years from when you start using it or seven years from uh, the manufacturing date on the helmet. But uh, the question I'm getting now is a lot of people buy Arai helmets as, um, you know, they're as collector pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't use them. They're sitting on their shelf uh, for, let's say, five years. And then they're like, well, you know, I kind of want to start using it now. If the helmet is not being used and it is just sitting on the shelf, does it have the same, you know, expiration date, uh, for lack of better words, as a helmet that's consistently being used? A helmet that's consistently being used will definitely need to be replaced before a helmet that's just sitting on the shelf. But we go by Snell's recommendation of replacing the helmet seven years from the date of manufacture or okay. five years of use. Okay, so and you guys still follow the same, the same mm -hmm. guidelines. Okay, gotcha. Um, and when it comes to uh, proper helmet fit, this is another one that uh, people have a hard time swallowing because uh, probably, I'm not even kidding, like 80 to 90% of people that come into our store and that bought their own helmets without like any guidance from a professional, they come in, in helmets that are too big for them because a properly right. fitted helmet always just, it feels too small if you don't know how it's supposed to fit. So uh, back me up on this. You want to see the cheap chipmunk cheeks, right? <laughs> you want to see that, um, and that's how a helmet should properly fit. You know, to an extent, what I like to tell people, you want to have the cheek pads as tight as you can comfortably wear them. Right. But let me just back up a second. I, I worked in a dealership many years myself, and the way that I tried to introduce people to the concept of wearing a full face helmet was to try to eliminate the things that stop them from putting on a helmet. And one of the things that made people pause is just getting the helmet on their head. So what I started doing is removing the cheek pads from the helmet. So now you can easily put the helmet on your head without fighting cheek pads, without the distraction of pressure on your face, and you can concentrate just on the crown fit. What I notice is that sometimes whenever a helmet is putting a lot of pressure on your face, you can't really feel what's happening on the top of your head. So by removing that distraction, now you can really just concentrate and make sure that that helmet has equal fit all the way around your hat line. So, you know, here with my hat, no matter how hard I press on the back of my hat, I can't create any kind of gap where I can fit my finger. My helmet fits the same way. So I, I wear this uh, motocross helmet, our VX Pro. I do a lot of eight, 10 hour cross country days in this helmet and I never feel like I have to take it off. It just fits all the way around my hat line consistently and evenly. And so when you have that kind of fit around the top of your head, now the helmet is being supported by this area, not just tight cheek pads alone. Okay. From there, put the set of cheek pads that give you the amount of pressure that you want in your face. That being said, if you don't want any pressure on your face, well, you need some pressure on your face. So it should be tight enough so that whenever you just move it side to side that you're not seeing the cheek pads lose contact with your face. I, I wear mine tight enough where I can almost bite my cheeks. So, you know, it's a little bit of a matter of preference there, but it needs to be tight enough that it stays secure, but it can't be loose enough to where wind is going to come up inside the helmet and make it noisy or, you know, lose contact with your face under just slight pressure. Yeah, and, and the helmet also from when it's new to when, you know, it has uh, writing hours on it, it does break in quite a bit, right? So, uh, like, uh, for how much would you say the cheek pads or up to what percentage would they break in after a person wears it and how long is that break-in period? It's hard to put a really definitive percentage on that, but my experience with our helmets are that if you clean them regularly and they're fitted properly from the start, there's very little change from the initial, you know, first day or two or a week of riding when you get it broken in until you're ready to retire the helmet. So I've had this helmet since 1998. Yep. It still feels like a great feeling helmet. Of course, it's been uh, nearly 20 years ago since I stopped wearing that helmet, but it still feels like a great fitting helmet. So the the foam that Arai uses and the cheek pads and the crown really lasts a long time. But the key is to start off with a helmet that fits correctly. Because if it's a little bit loose, it's gonna really feel 
a lot loose when you get on the road and now you have you know, 60 miles an hour with the wind pushing on the helmet. It's a little loose in the store. It's going to really feel loose at that point. And that's a huge safety issue as well, right? Having an oversized helmet, um, you know, in, in a crash could cause, you know, some, some major issues. We want you to have the smallest helmet you can comfortably wear. That's one of the reasons why uh, back in 2015, we started making all the cheek pads one size thinner throughout the lineup. So hopefully whenever someone goes to try on a, and a ride a day, even if they don't pull the cheek pads out, if they go to put it on, Hopefully it goes on easily and they find the correct crown fit on top of their head so that it can maximize the potential of the helmet. Because if a helmet is too big for your head, it doesn't matter how much you spend, spent on the helmet, but if it's two sizes for your head, your head's kind of bouncing around inside of it in an impact. So the helmet's never going to be able to give you the ultimate protection that it could give you if it was as if it was properly fitted. Yeah, and if and it needs to be properly strapped too. So many people think, well, it's tight enough on my head. What do I need to use the strap for, you know? But right. I've seen so many accidents where like the impact of the force is so great, the helmet will come flying off, even if it's tight on your head, right? So right. you need to have it yeah. properly strapped. Um, and as far as, uh, this is probably gonna be my last question, hopefully, <laughs> but if you uh, are carrying your helmet, right, and it's really close to the ground and you drop your helmet, it doesn't mean that helmet is donezo, right? Most of the, uh, I guess, um, damage done to a helmet in a crash is uh, from the inside with your own head and the, the exterior, if it's something, something simple like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, done and needs to be retired. So the, it's a really hard question to answer because you never know exactly what surface a helmet's landing on. Mm -hmm. If it's just a flat, smooth surface and it's only dropped a short distance, it's probably not broken. But if you had maybe a sharp rock that was stuck in the ground and it landed on a really sharp edge of a rock, even just dropped a couple of feet, that very focused impact energy could crack the shell. So if you ever have any questions about that, you can always contact us at info at riamericas.com. And you can send us pictures of your helmet and then we'll let you know, okay, we think yes or no, your helmet's done or maybe it's okay. And at that point, if we think maybe it's okay, then we'll authorize you to send the helmet to our office and we will do a free inspection of the helmet. The only thing it costs the customer is the shipping to come to and from our office. So if you're ever in a crash or uh, drop your helmet, you can always feel free to contact us. And uh, we'll be certainly glad to try to determine whether or not it is damaged or not. Gotcha. That's a really cool service. I didn't know that. So. Cool. Well, Scott, thank you so much for spending the time to answer all these questions. I'm sure a lot of people will find it really helpful. So thanks for taking the time. Um, and Guys, if you have any other questions, feel free to hit us up. And if we don't know the answers, uh, we'll find Scott and ask them. All right. Thanks, Scott. All right. Thank you for having us.